This show is sponsored by Alicia's Pillows and Things. Check out the Facebook page, Alicia's Pillows and Things, where you will find home decor you will not be able to resist at prices anybody can afford. Check out the pillows and stools of your favorite sports teams. Maybe you want a set of your kid's favorite cartoon or movie character. You can also get full body and neck pillows as well. Log on to NGSCSports.com and go to the Alicia's Pillows and Things tab on the homepage to complete your order. It makes a great gift for Christmas at an affordable price. NGSC Sports. We never stop. You're listening to NGSC Sports Radio. Hear us live on NGSCSports.com where you can get awesome analysis for all things sport. Or check out our podcasts on iHeartRadio, Spreaker, iTunes, TuneIn, and much more. For our latest videos, head to NGSC Sports' YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter at NGSC Sports and like us on Facebook. NGSC Sports. We never stop. Pretty dang gum magical, sir. It is. It's magical. Oh, magical Lionel. is that man's hair. Oh, Lionel. <laughs> oh, Lionel. <sighs> God, I have no football to watch tonight. As you don't, you don't want to rewatch the. Uh, you don't want to rewatch the uh, England Croatia game. Well, I mean, they don't show it on any freaking regular channel. So it was on uh, ESPN too. Oh, it was on the Deuce. Yes. Oh, I didn't tape it. Oh. <sighs> I'm sorry. It's all right. It's, it's all right. It's okay. I mean, we've got to talk about it, obviously, because, I mean, Nations Cup, obviously biggest international tournament there is. That's exactly right, Wes Bradshaw, as we get started on episode 237 of the A Foreign Affair podcast. A special, uh, I believe... It, Called it a, I called it a Thanksgiving Day news extravag something. I don't know. Uh, that- Let's just put it this way, folks. You're going to have two turkeys gobbling for a while. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> it's like morning talk radio. It's great. That's a, that's a joke my mom would really understand. Oh, well, good thing she listens. Uh, Huge fan. Please. Um, of course, I am Edward Green, joined as always by my call in crime, Wes Bradshaw, and we are here to bring you uh, this news and notes edition of the A Foreign Affair podcast. Of course, we will also be talking about the magic game that was England versus Croatia in the most important tournament to ever exist, and that is the UEFA Nations League, uh, specifically Group A. The other groups don't actually matter. It's just Group A that matters. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, Truthfully, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> so we'll, we'll be talking about that a little bit as we go forward. Uh, we're doing a lot of news and notes, though, tonight, because we didn't do news and notes last week. We'll be doing a lot of news and notes tonight. Uh, some big stories to get to there. And, of course, still hitting the watch for. And for the first time ever, I do believe a dual edition of So Raw. <gasps> But, oh, well, what do you mean? Oh, d- d- does that mean that Edward has has WWE news to bring to, to the segment? What? I hope so, because I don't have much. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> Excellent. This is, this I'm, glad you, I'm glad you're carrying my segment this week. This will be great. I can't wait. <laughs> uh, so, of course, we are, as always, represented by NGSC Sports at NGSCSports.com. We never stop. As well as Alicia's Pillows and Things. And let me tell you guys, uh, now that... Uh, you guys are listening to this on Thanksgiving Day. That's the first day it comes out. Uh, now that now that Clint Williams can finally get off the stick out of his ass and realize that Christmas is coming soon, <laughs> he and the rest of you, that is a joke for literally no one, uh, he and the rest of you can visit Alicia's Pillows and Things on I'm Facebook. Saying, uh, Clint, Clint might need to get his blood pressure checked. He has been quite salty in the month of November. <laughs> Yeah, a little, a little, a little overdose on the NACL there. Uh, so, but please visit Alicia's Pillows and Things on the Facebook app or on the Facebook on the computer. You can just search Alicia's Pillows and Things, and there you can find all sorts of great sports themed memorabilia as p- 
pillows and ottomans and I think blankets. Great deals galore there. You heard about them at the start of the show. You'll hear about them at the end. end. So visit Alicia's Pills and Things and get your thing today. So with that, let's uh, get started here on the pod. Again, the only match we're going to talk about today. We we weren't even really planning on talking about this because up until the 18th of November, nobody actually cared. But then it happened. Then it happened. And that result was England 2 Croatia won. Revenge is a dish best served in a tournament that actually no one cares about. Uh, That's Eng- crazy. It's <laughs> yeah. coming home. There you go. Uh, England with a 2-1 victory. Uh, come back at Wembley. Oh, and it had to be that man. Cometh the man. Cometh the hour. It was Harry Kane with the match winning goal in the 85th minute. Uh, off a set piece. England known for their set pieces. Uh, getting an outstretched toe from his boot onto the ball to poke it into the net uh, to get England all three points and get them a top of group four in group A, which means that they will be going to the semifinals to play a team that will be one of Portugal, Switzerland, and the Netherlands, who also won their groups. Netherlands also did it in very crazy fashion with a last minute virtual. Oh, and it was it was that man, the big Vigil. Mm. He's our favorite Dutchman. Uh, and just we, we can talk about this in a minute. Uh, Germany got relegated from that group, and and we talked about this before. This this thing is really stupid. Uh, Germany is going to now be with teams like uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and uh, and and teams like that. Uh, Aust- so you're so you're saying they're an underdog, which we understand. Yeah, there you go. Uh, hey, when they play Scotland, that's oof, that's going to be rough. For Scotland. So moving on here, uh, Wes, obviously a huge game for England. Uh, getting back, the, the announcers, Ian Dark and Taylor Twelman on the deuce, uh, telling us multiple times, you know, oh, yeah, you, you want to tell me this tournament doesn't matter to people. This Oh, you can feel the excitement. Amazing. Sure. Um, I, the, to be fair, it was an exciting match. Uh, I guess it, it is more exciting than a friendly. It, it, there is that aspect to it and it was fun to watch England with the comeback victory also uh thanks to a goal from Jesse Lingard as well in that one but Wes you know and obviously our as our resident England supporter here on on the podcast I'm sure you were thrilled but uh did this win spur you to care a lot more about the UEFA Nations League well Ed as today yes the day that we are uh recording this podcast Mm mm-hmm or maybe it was yesterday. I can't remember all of a sudden. <laughs> we are at precisely four years yes, from yes. the start of the 2022 World Cup. Mm-hmm. Or, as I'm calling it, based on this Nations League uh, performance, uh, England's second World Cup win. There you go. So, no, I'm not very excited. Of course I'm excited. I got it. I mean, you were excited it, before it, the match. You you were You were thrilled. <laughs> I was. I'm, 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 well, part of me was thrilled because um, you know, Dejan Lovren had like three of the most intense days of his life where he went from the highest of highs, yeah. <laughs> which was getting to elbow Sergio Ramos and beat Spain, yeah. <laughs> to the lowest of lows and losing to England. I know. I didn't get to make my Dejan Lovren joke. I totally forgot to do that. Oh, Best defender in the world. Goodness. Don't forget. Poor Lovren. And by the way, just to just throw it out, I sent you today. I hope you got to watch the whole thing. Yes, day. I did. I did. Oh my mm. goodness! That five minute four four tunes. Uh, they did it versus Ramos. Yeah, was one of the funniest things I've ever <laughs> Multiple seen. Multiple gunshot wounds. Oh Multiple my! Gosh. And, and I, I felt that you would especially enjoy uh, when they played FIFA against. Yes. Yes. Four hundred thirty six to nil. <laughs> um, but you, you know, I was kind of excited about it just because. You know, as an England fan, man, we we got to take what we can get sometimes. Well, and to be fair, you were also excited. I think you texted me uh, because it was also the Wayne Rooney tes- testimonial, I guess is kind of what it became, uh, when the England took on the United States. Oh, uh, yeah. England uh, the and, and they won. And But what your comment obviously struck me as, you know, you take out Rooney, and I think there was one more player. I, I genuinely um, don't know. Um, but, uh, Ashley oh, Young? Oh, God. Um, no, it wasn't even him. It was... Um, Manchester City, um, Delph, Fabian Delph. Oh yes, yes, yeah. If you take those guys out, and you can you can take it from there. 
Um, that's what really struck me, though. Basically, you had an England team on the field that were all, like, 24 and under. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're talking, you know, the Raheem Sterlings, the, um, uh, oh, God, Jaden Sancho getting mm-hmm. his really some significant playing time. Um, you know, Trent Alexander-Arnold scored. Mm-hmm. Um, God, but I mean, you look at it, it's just it's it was an extremely young, exciting England team, mm-hmm. and not to say that's going to be the starting eleven at the next World Cup because obviously, I mean, you know, Harry Kane didn't play in that match. Yes. Um, you know, there were there were obviously some guys who didn't play in that match who probably will be in four years. Uh, but you know, and, and even somebody like Jesse Lingard, who obviously on club level, I have no use for, <laughs> um, as as long as well as Marcus Rashford, but you know. England have the makings of a really dynamic team that when we look back at this 2018 World Cup, it, it's not going to be a – I don't think this is a fluke from England. Mm-hmm. Now, I did say it, but I'm not really saying that England's going to go win 2022 World Cup. Right. But I think England are going to have a chance to go into that tournament – as one of the favorites mm-hmm. or, or even have that, um, that vaunted Belgium dark horse status. Yeah. You know, which Belgium's had for the last two world Cups. Well, you know, they're, they're the team. That... Mm-hmm. I think England could be in that realm real quick. Uh, I just want to throw out there uh, too. Uh, Belgium did not get out of their group that can uh, contain Switzerland and Iceland. That's right. Uh, you're welcome. Zern and Shakir. Oof. You're welcome from Zerd Shakir. He, he, he had, uh, against Belgium, he had two assists and set up a third goal. So, yeah. Oof. Um, you know, and as someone who's not a big fan of most of the Belgians, <laughs> um, sorry, Simone Mignolet, I don't really give a rat's ass anymore. <laughs> That's um, you know, I, I kind of like A, Belgium going out, and B, uh, Shakiri being the one who did it. Of course. <laughs> nice. uh, but, you know, this England team, though, they're – I mean, they've got the makings of what could be a really, really good group coming up. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not getting that golden generation status because I think we kind of realize yeah. maybe, maybe we shouldn't burden someone else with that. Good anytime point. Soon again. That didn't really work out for us the first time. But, I mean, then you still look at guys coming up. You look at like a Phil Foden. Yes. Or maybe even a Rian Brewster. Uh, Liverpool, who hasn't even made his Premier League debut yet, but, you know, has been just excellent at youth level. He's 18. You know, Foden's a young player. Um, And, I mean, you look at those under-19, under-23 teams, I believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that won World Cups. Yeah. And, I mean, that's got to count for something, hopefully, going forward. So, I mean, I think on the international front for England – it is an exciting time coming up because there are a lot of uh, a lot of young, good-looking players coming up, and also something we're going to dive into a little more in depth with this whole Brexit thing means you you might see more of them playing in England. <laughs> That's true. So, which uh, I can't really figure out. I can't. I, uh, uh, I don't know. I can't decide what I really think about that idea. Um. But, I mean, it, on the international scene for England, it is an optimistic moment where, for the last decade, it certainly has not been, we'll put it that way. <laughs> certainly. Um, and so, going forward from here now, obviously, England, again, will be playing in the Nations League semifinals, which I do believe matters somewhat. Again, this whole thing's very confusing. I do well, think I it... do believe if you win this, you get you automatically go to Europe. Uh, do, 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 do. Isn't it like an automatic European? Now, and also being in the being in the semifinals guarantees you at least a spot in the playoffs. Uh, let me see. I'm trying to read this. So, you know, basically the way it was put was, um, you know, for England, and I believe this is for all of them. This at least gets you in the playoffs. Um, you know, for England, they could lose every one of their qualifiers and still be in the playoff for Europe mm-hmm. for 2020. So, go. I mean, it, it does mean something, you know, in the long run, it does mean something. Okay. So, so England getting to play in that, and again, they will be playing against one of uh, either Portugal, the Netherlands, or Switzerland in their uh, semifinal matchups, which will be taking place 
next year, uh, June 5th and 6th over in Portugal. So uh, Portugal will be getting some home field advantage there, obviously. Uh, so just a quick weekend tournament, 5th, 6th is the the semifinals and on the ninth is both the third place match and the final um so so wes we'll, we'll conclude this little segment with just thoughts on the uefa nations league as a whole now england obviously are going through to to the nations league final knockout stage uh in the semifinals uh, has this has this made you more interested in the nations league does it seem teams uh, of this caliber with England playing Spain, uh, Germany playing France, you know, the, these teams playing in what would normally be friendly spots on the international calendar. Does this make you more interested and think this is a better idea? Or are you still kind of like, eh, it doesn't really matter? Um, I think England, I'm going to tell you really, this la- this group that you've got, in the semifinals, I think to me makes it more interesting mm-hmm. because I mean, if you looked at every group, uh, who thought that these would have been the teams that would have come out of the group? Now, the Portugal—I can't even tell you who was in Portugal's group. So uh, Portugal was yeah. Italy and Poland. Yeah, I mean, you know, so I guess Portugal probably would have been the favorite. Mm-hmm. Maybe Portugal and Italy, yeah, to come out, <clears throat> but um. I mean, in a group with Spain and Croatia, who would have thought England? Yeah. In a group with uh, France and Germany, who would have thought the Dutch would come out? The, the Dutch team that did not make <laughs> the World Cup. Exactly. I mean, and, and you know, I'll say something on that moment. And then, you know, Belgium group, who would have thought the Swiss were coming out? Yeah. So, I mean, really, there were out three out of the four groups were upset. Mm-hmm. I mean, which makes it, I think, makes it even more interesting. You know, that's that's pretty freaking cool. Sure. Um, and then I'll tell you this for, uh, for England, for England, I think it's big because once again, it's given these guys more international experience and it's getting these young guys some international experience Mm -hmm. and it's doing it in matches that, you know, for whatever you think they do matter. I mean, more than a daggone friendly does. Um, you know, you look at the Dutch and I just wanted to touch on the Dutch. I mean, this is their redemption story right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're they're now this much closer to Euros, but also for the Dutch, you know, they're seeing that, hey, in a competitive environment, suddenly, hey, it's not as bad as it was. Yeah. Um, you know, Ronald Koeman. Ronald Koeman. Um, I mean, he's, he's doing a great job of getting it together, organizing things. Uh, they're being inventive with how they play. You know, the other night... Um, Virgil van Dyke had been moved to striker Oh, near the end of that match. And of course he, he gets the, mm-hmm. the, the equalizer that wins them the group. And you know, they're, they're thinking outside of the box in the Netherlands right now. I think that's big for them. Mm-hmm. You know, someone like Switzerland who is, you know, Switzerland's always in the top 10, but no one really worries about Switzerland at the end of the day. Right. You know, for them, this could be that big step that maybe makes them, real contenders going forward. Mm -hmm. So, you know, France is going to tell you they don't give a shit. Germany's going to tell you they don't give a shit. Belgium's going to tell you they don't give a shit. You know, Spain, they don't give a shit. You know, all the teams who didn't qualify are going to tell you they didn't give a shit. Um, But, you know, I I think, I think especially with some of these national teams that are having to turn over like they are now, Mm -hmm. I think it's almost good for them because, I mean, you can only find out so much in a friendly because sure. it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. But at least there was some <clears throat> consequence to this. You know, now, Jurgen Klopp may disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I know, the, I know the club managers weren't happy about it because they felt it was a little more undue strain. But, you know, for, for the football fan, it, it was, I mean, it's definitely a hell of a lot more interesting than anything else going on. <laughs> That's true. You know, that is true. And, it doesn't um, actually matter. You know, and uh, it's still, I mean, here's the thing. They were going to play the damn international match. Mm-hmm. So you were going to get screwed over in a friendly PSG. We're going to get screwed over in Nations League <laughs> PSG. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it just, yeah. at least, at least they were playing for something. Yeah. That's and we're bringing it home. So that, that's all there is. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. home. It's coming. It's coming. Home. It's never been. It's never been anywhere. But it's... 
There you go. So that's and it gives me another excuse to sing the song. That song. Oh, it's, the song will continue forever. Um, so that's going to do it though for our match talk. Uh, again, Nations League uh, semifinals will be taking place next June, so you have a long time to wait for that to happen. All right, so let's get hit the no- news and notes now. Uh, we're going to start with a story, Wes, that you did mention um, just a bit ago. Uh, the the English FA, the Football Association, has uh, apparently put forward a Brexit proposal to increase the homegrown EPL player uh, limit. Um, right now, uh, you can have up to 17 players uh, from not – England and homegrown academy players on your 25 man squad. It looks like the FA is thinking about taking that number down to 12. Uh, right now, teams, if, if it went through, that would be kind of screwed over with this, include Manchester City as well as Tottenham, um, who have uh, a lot of overseas players. Bournemouth, right now, as this article from Bleacher Reports notes, uh, has only five right now. So they, they would be more than okay with that. Um, but this is well, a basically. I mean, basically, it would be the big money teams. Sure. I mean, that's who. Yeah, I mean, that's who gets. That's who gets hurt when that's the big money team. Yeah, you know, Chelsea very much the same way as that. Uh, there, there would definitely be some some cuts that would have to get made. Um, I mean, even you know, like Liverpool. Granted, they, some guys like Trent Alexander Arnold and Andy Robertson have been coming up, but then you have their entire front three. With uh, Firmino, Salah, and, and Mane, obviously no, no no homegrown talent there. Uh, Alisson, not homegrown. Um, no. Naby Keita, guys like that. Um, so, as, I as mean, you... and Virgil, Virgil's mm-hmm. not homegrown. I mean, we do, but and maybe more than a lot of others. But mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, God, you know, I mean, the Premier League has kind of thrived on being able to bring in these international players and that's kind of what's made the league over the years mm-hmm. and right now the uh, the report says that uh england's top tier is under pressure to agree a deal with the fa for brexit uh, if the clubs do not do so they could face a nightmare no deal scenario in which all european players would have to fulfill the same criteria that non-european players do now in order to get a work permit which is a nightmare for people uh, obviously, that that is, uh, there's been a lot of exceptions and and ways for non-European players to come into the Premier League and get those work permits. So they I can't... wish they could show us. We're we're still waiting to see this Alan Rodriguez character. <laughs> well, uh, thinks on like his fourth loan now because we can't get a fucking work permit. <laughs> well, it's gonna get even harder. Um, obviously, there is a lot of stupid stuff going on with Brexit right now. Theresa May's cabinet is falling apart left and right, as was seen on last week tonight with John Oliver. Uh, when she made her proposal to Parliament the other day, uh, she was just laughed at, which I wish would happen more in America when when leaders come to make proposals that people are just like, ha ha, yeah, okay, buddy. Um, so Theresa May is in a, a bit of trouble in that. Um, so uh, aside from Brexit, Wes, this is something... You know, and as far as it, its overreaching implications for the country as a whole, this is something that could have a profound impact on the Premier League. And I don't want to say, you know, you were, it could become a good thing later on, as as England would be able to fo- or would have to focus more on growing English talent because we have seen it does exist, but short term it would be a nightmare scenario. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it is, um, <clears throat> I mean, it has the makings of, I mean, I mean, like we said, we just mentioned all these teams that have invested so much money. I mean, mm-hmm. this, this has the chance to just blow that to hell. Mm-hmm. And I mean, uh, if you're a team, like if you are a Manchester city, if you are a Tottenham and, and you came into this league with these sets of ground rules, and all of a sudden, you have to be change it for for things that aren't even in your control. I mean, at that point, do you? I mean, this is coming from American, obviously. Do you sue? Because we love being litigious here. Uh, do you do you threaten to leave the league? I mean, these are these are unfair conditions. Now, obviously, the, again, it's the top clubs that would be affected the most. 
but those would also have the most power over the league, as we've seen. Yeah. I mean, it would, um, I'll tell you, man, this whole, the whole Brexit thing has just, I mean, oh, man, you know, and whether you agree with it or don't, I can see both sides of the argument, don't get me wrong. It's kind of like a lot of things, you know, if you look back at it, if you look at it without your, you know, politically tinted glasses, you can see where both sides have points. But, you know, the the whole thing that has been pointed out is how in in Britain, you know, people didn't show up to vote against it. Mm-hmm. And it got voted in. Yeah. Um, now, really, I, I, I truly believe with, you know, English Parliament and the government, they, they won't worry about the Premier League here. No, of course not. This is obviously just an offshoot issue now sure. that the Premier League is having. Um, but, you know, two, you've got the, you know, I think a lot of it's going to come down to what the FA tries. Mm-hmm. You know, the FA themselves have been trying to put, they have no problem trying to push this. Yeah. Because when you really think about it, the FA and the Premier League, that's two separate entities. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, they work pretty well hand in hand with mm-hmm. each other, but, you know, the Premier League ain't that worried about the English national team. No. You know, now, don't get me wrong. They they like it for the marketing aspects of it. You know, a, a good England, hey, that's marketing. But, yeah, you know, it's kind of like we had in this country, you know, U.S. men's national team versus MLS. You know, who's really looking out for who here? Sure. But the FA for a long time has been trying to find ways to – you know, get more English players playing. Mm -hmm, And, you know, you, you hear it come up every year. Recently it's coming up about, well, you know, they're not playing Dominic Solanke. We would really appreciate if they'd play Solanke more. (laughs) And Klopp's like, that's great. I'm trying to win the premier league. And he's not the guy who's going to win me the premier league. (laughs) You know, I'm I'm trying to win trophies and Dom while in two years, he, he might be ready to help us right now. He's not the guy to help Liverpool lift the premier league or lift the champions league. Um, but hey, the English FA, they would love for us to play some. So, you know, as someone who does identify as an England fan, and obviously I'm a Liverpool fan as well, it's it, there's no easy answer to this question from my perspective, mm-hmm. because it's almost like you're you're robbing from one to, you know, give it to someone else and then taking it right back from them. Mm-hmm. Um. And, you know, there, there is, let's put it this way. I don't think this is going to go, this is not going to be anything easy. No. Like you said, I mean, litigation is in the books. And, I mean, you think about it, you're now getting, it seems like, to a majority of non-native owners. Mm-hmm. You've got American owners. You've Absolutely. got Middle Eastern owners. You've got Chinese owners. Mm-hmm. You know, so... I mean, as you said, I mean, these guys, you know, hey, as much as I love FSG, um, at the end of the day, for FSG, Liverpool is a business. Sure. Liverpool is the business. Now, you know, as we G with the Red Sox, FSG are willing to put their money where their mouth is and mm-hmm. try to win. Mm-hmm. Which I appreciate. They're, well, they're uh, they're in the uh-huh. business to win games and titles. But it's still a business. Exactly. They're in the business to win titles because winning titles is better for business. Yes, exactly. (laughs) You know, um, you know, the same with the Glazers Mm -hmm. at Man United, the same with the Sheik at Man City, Um, you know, the same with Roman, obviously, at Chelsea. And at the end of the day, you know, these guys didn't they didn't buy into the Premier League, the most lucrative league in the world. They didn't buy into it and get into it to promote the English national team. (laughs) Yeah. Um I think I think that the Premier League could be in big danger if you know if this is pushed through that a lot of these big money entities could decide, well, you know what, this isn't what I'm here for. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna sell. 
And then suddenly you're going to lose that money. You know, you're going to lose some of those deep pockets coming in. You're not going to have the same. Ownership. And then suddenly the, well, you know, obviously if you can't bring in the best players in the world internationally, the level's going to fall. But also if the money walks away, the level's going to fall. Yeah. And the FA could, you know, the FA could get their way here. Grown players. And they might, I'm not going to say they're going to, they're not going to kill the Premier League. Sure. But they could kill the Premier League being the big money league in the world. Absolutely. 100%. So, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is something that's going to continue. Obviously, this is something in Brexit that is going to be continuing for, it looks to be a very long time. Uh, whether it goes through or not, whether there's, I don't think there'll be, but maybe a second referendum. Who knows? But this is obviously a giant story for all of England. Uh, but this is also a gigantic story for the Premier League and one that will continue to evolve. And, and we'll see because obviously the FA, they can put this forward, but it can't really go through until plans for Brexit right. actually go through either. So, right. That's... And, you know, personally, and, you know, I'm, as you know, the people may have figured out listening to us, uh, you and I don't always line up exactly. Politically. I'm a little more right leaning. You're a little more left leaning. What? I don't believe you. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> Nothing at all. But um, you know, from the British government side, I can see where Brexit is a plus for them. Mm-hmm. But also looking from the from socially, uh, sport wise. And see where Brexit could be a big problem for them as well, mm-hmm. and um, I mean, it's it's something that we're go- we're going to have to keep up with going forward because yeah. hey, we taught we taught the football in England as our mm-hmm. that's our home base, yeah. and <clears throat> I mean Brexit, this FA proposal, this could have massive Premier League implications in the next say five years, certainly, and, and that's. That's where the timetable we're looking at right now. Obviously, you know, plans have to start being met. Uh, if there is actually going to be a Brexit with, you know, again, with people leaving the campaign, with people leaving Theresa May's cabinet uh, because of the deal and that's being worked on, who knows when this will actually end up going through, if it goes through at all. But as Wes said, we are going to have to keep up with this. Uh, so let's let's transfer, though, to something that is absolutely not controversial at all. In, in no way, shape, or form, a, a resounding success and wa- and a hundred percent approval. Uh, VAR will be coming to the Premier League next season. Yeah, Woo! great. This is... Can we retroactively do it back to the Arsenal? Oh God, if only, if uh, only. Uh, the the Premier League will be moving to video assistant replays, as we saw at this year's World Cup and a couple other tournaments as well. Uh, they the Carabao Cup has been using it. Don't I have no idea what that is. I'm some weird tournament. Uh, but they're, they've been using it uh, in their trials. And now starting with the 2019-20 uh, season, uh, VAR will be used in the Premier League. Uh, nobody, I'm sure, happier than Southampton's Charlie Austin. I'm sure he's delighted that VAR will start to be used. Um you know, Mark Hughes saying, uh, quote, all the major sports have video reviews. And for some reason, the Premier League, which is watched all around the world, is still in the dark ages. Um, so that is coming. <laughs> I I am. I, I've seen so many people opposed to this. And I just, for the life of me, cannot figure it out really why. And it's not, you know, I, I understand it's got to be more concise. I have to understand it's got to be more clear. And those things have to be worked out. Don't get me wrong. It was certainly not perfect at the World Cup. There there, there will be definite kinks to continue to iron out in the entire process from what can be reviewed, how fast can it be reviewed, how fast can the review process actually take because of the way soccer works. But to hear people and to read comments from people who say, we don't want VAR because... Well, that's just how the game should be played, and you know, it, and humans get calls wrong. To me, is insane. I I don't understand it. I if I am the supporter of a team, 
I want the calls to be right. I, I want to know at the end of the day that my team won or lost because all the correct calls were made and my team didn't do enough. I don't want to keep thinking the ref screwed us over. The ref got us one. He, he, he's, he's been paid off. I can't do the accent. But I, I think that <laughs> this, this reaction to it's taking away from the beauty of the game and majesty is so stupid. Like I, I'm sorry, it just it just is. Why would you not want the right calls to be made? It doesn't make sense, Wes. Can you enlighten me in this at all? Um, I would say you know I listen to a lot of outside podcasts from yes, ours. Um, I have you know for a few years, obviously for ours, and I have heard some of the crotchetiest old school. Former players, say, oh no, it's, it'll kill the spirit of the game. Uh, you hear that? It'll kill the spirit of the game. This isn't how it meant to be played. So all of a sudden, yeah, why do we not have VAR in the Premier League? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think, especially after the World Cup this summer, I think the argument is dead for not having VAR at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's gone from – and trust me, look, I've had, when I watch the NFL, mm-hmm. I've had my NFL issues with replay. Mainly because, mainly with that, it was because, you know, the fucking NFL just can't figure out what their rules actually are from year to year. Yeah. You know, what is a catch? Yeah. That's, that's not a, a VAR catch? issue. That's just a we have stupid rules issue. Yes. I mean, what is a catch? You know, we, we grew up as kids throwing the football around in the yard and – you know, some of us played football, some of us didn't. Um, but that didn't us stop didn't us from commenting on it. <laughs> it didn't stop you from co- from uh, commentating it. Yes. Anyway. Um, but, you know, it, it always seemed pretty cut and dry what a catch was. Sure. And apparently in the last 20 years of replay being in the NFL, I was so wrong in life it wasn't <laughs> funny. I had no idea what the hell a catch was. But anyway, when you saw football, I mean, it's – I mean, it, it seems like it's more cut and dry. It's, was this guy offside? Was he sure. not offside? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, we've got the goal. The goal line technology has worked great. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think we figured that out. I mean, basically the biggest thing right now for VAR is offside. Yeah. And potentially Getting like handball. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 yes. Yeah, so, something like that. But these are things that, you know, now could handball become the NFL catch <laughs> but, um, but that's the thing I mean, handball already things, is we we yeah, know this Wes is, yeah. what's a handball <laughs> yeah exactly you know so but you know we saw at the world cup you know the thing they all oh it'll disrupt I don't I mean you should be able to make these calls in two minutes mm-hmm. absolutely stop the play you know say three minutes total you stop play he goes over he watches it you know you've got a timer to make a decision mm-hmm and you go out and you continue playing. Well, and what did we see? We, we, we heard this a lot, especially in the early stage of the World Cup. We heard the referees, especially like the, the side judges, were instructed, oh. when in doubt, let the play go. And yeah. and because – so if a goal gets scored, it can yep. be reviewed. And if exactly. it was an offsides, you can go back and change it. And that's exactly. – I, I don't understand. Exactly. Well, and it's obviously – Far from cut and dry, it's. I'm sure there's. It's political. There's everything going on in there. It feels like Grandpa Simpson going out and being old man yells at Cloud. Oh my like. <laughs> Oh man, and I mean that is kind of what it is. We are hurtling toward VAR though. It's gonna happen. Mm-hmm. Praise be to Jeebus. It's yes. gonna happen. Absolutely. Um, I mean, this is just something that's very overdue at this point. And you know what? As I jokingly said, well, can we go back and look at the match? You know what? There's going to be times it goes against my team. Mm -hmm. There's going to be times it's for my team. It's going to win us points. It's going to lose us points. But you know what? At the end of the damn day, if you get the call right, what can I say? Yeah. What can you say? If your team, if Spurs get, hey, we'll go back to one of the Spurs goals earlier this year in the 2-2. Was that this year? Or was that last year? Are you talking about Liverpool? 
Yeah. Yeah, that yeah, was, that was uh, that last, was last year. year. Last, last year. year. Yeah. You know, the one at Anfield. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what? If if they had gone back and looked at that on would you have had an issue at the end of the day? No, can't. If you had seen on there and they explained to you this is why he's offside, mm-hmm. would you have had an issue at the end of the day with it? No. If they had said, you know what, he was onside, I wouldn't have had an issue at the end of the day with it. Sure. But when you left both of us sitting there guessing what I'm saying, mm-hmm. no, he was onside. You know, you could have easily fixed this. Yes. And everybody would have been, well, yeah, okay. Um, it, we have reached a point in time where we have, as they said in the $6 million man, we have the technology. <laughs> yes. We can the technology is there. Play. It is being shown in other leagues. The technology is there. Mm-hmm. The Premier League, as we just talked about in our last segment, you're the biggest, most successful monetary-wise league in the world. You're mm-hmm. the most viewed league in the world. There's no excuse that you can't do this mm-hmm. and have it in by next season. Certainly. So I believe I believe next season we're going to have VAR in the Premier yes, League. it's coming. Um, <clears throat> it's coming, and it's going to be. It's here. It's good. It's, it's going to be. Good. All right. So. Moving on from that story um, to another Premier League story. There's a report coming out that I'm sure will not actually happen, uh, but that Chelsea are facing a potential two-year transfer ban for their illegal youth team science. And I find it Ooh. shocking to believe that a team that loans out 800 players a year would have <laughs> legal youth team signings. You, you th- yeah, you would think they had a... You think they knew the inside and outside. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You would. Um, the the oh, investigation started from FIFA uh, when Chelsea signed Bertrand Traore, one of the Traores, uh, from Burkina Faso before his 18th birthday, which you cannot do. Um, the penalties came down, what could potentially be, if proven to be true, FIFA's Integrity and Compliance Unit have recommended that Chelsea should be banned from signing players for one transfer window for the Traore signing and three further transfer windows for 13 other offenses, plus a fine of 45,000 pounds. Um, but obviously the most important of that is transfer. <laughs> sir, yes, that is, that is not much money considering uh, that no. one of the things they've been accused of doing is paying Troy's mother a hundred, over 150,000 pounds exactly. to, uh, to, to help sweeten the deal. So obviously this, this has not been uh, concluded yet. But, Wes, this is for, again, a team that really does, you know, I was half joking earlier about all those those uh, loans and, and signings they make. But for a team that does make this many moves every, especially summer transfer seat, uh, window, this would be a huge hit. But a big part of me just doesn't see this sticking, or at the very least, it'll get reduced. Yeah, I mean, I can't see it hanging on too long here. Um, but I mean, the implications, if it did, Oh yeah. I mean, that would be a dang on the, you know, you look at the way Chelsea are set up right now. I mean, that would be a, that would be a death blow mm-hmm. to Chelsea over the next few years. When you look at Chelsea, I mean, this is a, that they are. They are in need of refreshing right now. Sorry's coming in. That was kind of the deal. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that this is a team that's going to be turned over some few years, and suddenly you slap a transfer embargo on them. Ooh, I mean, you're looking at them having to like actually play players that they have under contract. What? Are, are, wait, are you saying that Ruben Loftus Cheek might actually have to play for Chelsea? Oh my God, the dream. <laughs> Why the country? You would see all these guys. Wait, he's a Chelsea? Yeah. Really? What the hell? <laughs> Is that Bertrand, Ke- Bertrand trailer? <laughs> Kevin, Dr- <laughs> Kevin De Bruyne retroactively has to go back to Chelsea. Yeah, I mean, it'd be crazy. You know, um, God, Mason Mount would get his way in. <laughs> um, but this is a team that needs refreshing. And there's the, you know, the rumor mill obviously is charming. Oh, you love um, the rumor mill. And there's, uh, there's a a rumor out there that Chelsea are going to shell out 70 to 80 million pounds in January to try to bring in Christian Pulisic. Mm-hmm. And that they could be looking to spend big money in January to get ahead of an embargo if they think there's going to be one coming in. Sure. 
Um, and of course, as we talked about um, earlier in the year, you know, with the way the champion, the European rules have changed about playing for multiple teams in a European competition, mm-hmm. um, you know, that, that'll, that will open up as we've talked about mm-hmm. big January spending and Same. the rumor mill is hot and heavy for January. I mean, huge names changing. Now, will they actually happen? That <laughs> obviously remains to be seen. But in the past, I mean, it wouldn't have even been brought up. That, shh, he's not going anywhere. What the fuck are you all talking about? <laughs> you know, yeah, maybe next summer. But, um, but that is one that Chelsea, if they feel a yeah, – I, I think January could be a big indicator for us because if they feel that sanctions are coming, mm-hmm. Chelsea could be looking to splash the cash in January. Certainly. And then that will be – could be their last transfer window to actually remain competitive in what has become an ultra competitive Premier League, especially at the top of the table. Um, to with with what Liverpool and City have done, you know, Manchester United is at some point is going to have to start coming back. Arsenal are coming on strong. Tottenham are you know they're not making moves, but they're still really good. Uh, and then with teams like uh, uh, Bournemouth and Watford and Wolves coming up right behind them, especially that Wolf squad um, with the way they're spending the money. There's Chelsea can't rest on their laurels, laurels and they could not afford a, a, a two-year ban like that if they want to stay trying to be in those one of the Champions League spots. So yeah. very tough for them. Yeah. Um, tough and a story I take no pleasure in. Uh, Benjamin Mendy will be having a second knee surgery at Manchester City. And, and again, we, we don't ever want <clears throat> players to get hurt. We, we do not peddle in that. That is terrible. Um, but ever since Mendy went after a reporter for reporting what his doctors had told him about his injury and saying that the reporter lied, and then it turned out to be completely true, uh, I have no love for Benjamin Mendy. And so I, I don't feel that bad that he has, again, in, suffered a knee injury. So... Sorry about you, Mr. Mendy. Uh, I guess you're back on the Mendy. Hey. Oh, got him. Goodness. Got him again. Uh, so he had, ah, so got he, him. <laughs> got him. The, the city uh, defensive player had surgery on his left knee last week. And uh, looks like he will be out uh, for a significant period of time again for city. Uh, heading over now. Well, well, real, oh, real quick, sorry, just throwing on Mendy. Sure. You know, Mindy was the world record left back signing. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and the fact that City were able to do what they did last season, and season without him, mm-hmm. it is extremely admirable. Yeah. Um, but you know, you look at a guy who was coming in, and you know, when, when he was signed, Benjamin Mindy's supposed to be like the next big thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, coming from that incredible Monaco team. Um, as we said, they shelled out big time money for Mindy and thus far they are not getting their money's worth. And one thing to look for Mindy in the future, so much of his worth was based on the fact that he could, he was his pace, Mm -hmm. the fact that he could fly and do all these things. And man, two major knee injuries. Those don't really bode well for, uh, Mm. (laughs) sprinters. (laughs) No, and even at 24 years old, certainly. Exactly. Um, you know, major knee injuries are major. So it'll it'll be something to watch how Mindy can come. Yeah, he had come back pretty good this year, but certainly wasn't at the level he was with the mm-hmm. knee injury. So yeah, something to definitely keep an eye on going forward uh, will be you know, the recovery of Benjamin Mindy and just what kind of player we end up seeing for City. But also, you've got to think, you know, where does City stand on their left back position? Yeah, they spent big money on them, but they now two. Years. Mm-hmm. Is City going to look to go? Maybe not in January, but is City going to be looking to drop some cash on that position going forward? I mean, they they probably will have to. I mean, right now, Mendy has played fifteen matches uh, in the one plus year he's been at City due to injuries, yeah. so. Not not a great return on investment so far for City. Then again, oh, well, they, so they can they can take some flyers here and there. <laughs> apparently, um, our next uh, our final story in the Premier League, 
um, comes to us sort of from Arsenal. And again, we're not going to talk about the European Super League. Um, but it, there was some thought of, well, maybe, you know, this wasn't actually happening. You know, maybe the, the reports coming out of that, the league where the, there was like the 11 founding members and the five temporary members, that wasn't actually true. Well, uh, Arsenal's, uh, was, uh, the managing director of Arsenal, Vinay Venkatesham, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, came yeah. out and said, no, it was totally happening, uh, but guys, we definitely were not going to be part of it. Like, we were on the list, but hey, we were we were going to turn it down, and, and we were just there because, you know, we just, we wanted to keep tabs, and because and you can't make changes and stop people from from doing things like this if you don't have a seat at the table so so that's what we were doing we definitely were not going to be part of this though absolutely not mm -mm, not us right because of course if you go back to our uh american owners in the premier league you know stan Kroenke. wow i mean he's only in it for the glory right oh yeah I mean, I don't, I don't think, you know what, I mean, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's in it for the glory. Yeah, he, he's in about money. <laughs> yeah, Arsenal, sure. Arsenal are saying that because right now it's not in front of them to have to do anything. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know, every everybody's a badass. When their heads. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's what's going on with that. Um, the, the, uh, the competition right now still slated for 2021 i doubt it's going to happen as, as of right now but no. i just just stop guys fucking stop please like we don't, we don't need this we really just don't yeah. need this um so kind of a a sort of joined pair of stories coming here um coming out of real madrid santiago solari has been confirmed as the manager until their, his boss gets tired of him through the end of this season and through the end of the 2021 season. In fact, or, at Real or Madrid, like you just said, the, the end of this. Yeah, after <laughs> taking over this and midway through the season for Julian Lapetegui. Um, of course, we had so many things. While Solari was the the quote unquote interim manager, you know. Rizzo Pochettino going is is Josie gonna go there you know and and looks like those have now finally been put to bed uh, as Solari is going to be the the man for the foreseeable future at least at Real Madrid and things have been going slightly better for him there but the man he replaced Lopetegui uh, he it came out this week that apparently he wanted to be the next U.S. men's national team coach. And they turned him down. And I heard a lot of people going, "Oh, well, but but he's good. He's great. How you you had nobody that caliber is is banging down the USMNT's door." And I just couldn't help but thinking that, well, that is true. I'm sure he's a very good coach. That people in the USMNT decision making conglomeration <laughs> saw what happened when he was the head coach at Spain. And how he kind of just bolted on them for the Real Madrid job. And we're like, yeah, we we don't want to deal with that. So uh, <sighs> thanks, but no thanks, Mr. Lopetwiggy. So, uh, you know, this could have been a very big name hire for the U.S. And, and I don't believe it's actually been reported exactly why they, they told him no. But that seems like a little bit of serendipity on their part. Well, now, saying that they told him no. You know, if you ask his people, they never, mm -hmm. no one ever made an offer to anyone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, both I think both of them are trying to say that it's the other one who did it. So, obviously, somewhere in the middle lies the truth. Here's my deal on Lopetegui. If Lopetegui was interested in the job and the US MNT, MNT was interested in him, mm -hmm. I have no idea why the hell you wouldn't hire the guy. That's true. I mean, I mean that would by far be the probably. I mean, I, I guess you say the word best, but I mean, has there ever been a more accomplished man who could? Mm -hmm. Point. Um, I mean, former manager Real Madrid, former Spanish manager, and here's the thing, you know, I think it's a little bit of a false narrative. 
to mm. say that he dipped on Spain. He didn't dip on Spain. He basically said, hey, you know, I'm here and I'm going to do my job. But once we're done, I'm taking this job over here. Mm -hmm. I'm just giving you guys a heads up. <laughs> and this, to me, the Spanish FA was incredibly arrogant in saying, well, you know what? Fuck you. <laughs> um, I think I just think that was so poorly handled on Spain's part and also Real Madrid's. Sure. You know, to me, Real Madrid almost forced his hand in this issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, here's the thing, you know, if that's your dream job and you've got the chance to get it, and yes, it did end up going to shit for him, but still, you know, I mean, that's Real Madrid is the biggest job in club football in the world. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it's one of those, you know, when you get your kind of take, it. Mm -hmm. you know, kind of everybody who's anybody manages Madrid. I mean, yeah. as as you will find out, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, but, you know. Sorry. Eventually, you've got to figure, if his star keeps rising, that's where Poch will probably end up. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, so I, I really, I don't put so much of that on Lopetegui. I think he, he went for a job that anyone would go for. Um, I just think it got handled so poorly on Madrid and the Spanish FAs in. But I'm going to tell you, man, if Lopetegui was interested, I think the USMNT would be crazy to sit there and say, uh, no. Yeah. Um, I mean, now there are things that the fit in with it. Mm -hmm. you know, obviously, they feel they want an English-speaking manager and i don't think he speaks english um well not, mm -hmm, not at enough. least not well yeah. enough to you know, mm -hmm. that's a that's a minus on him you know also the fact that i mean once again this is a guy that the spain and the real madrid job mm -hmm. sorry we we love the usmnt but kind of i mean that's like that's like going from the sec to the sun Belt. yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know I, I don't see nick saban leaving alabama yeah. Take over, you know, Louisiana Lafayette anytime soon. Very true. <laughs> I don't see that happening. Um, so you know, if if there was interest, I think the UFC would be crazy to not in the at the very least explore to the fullest possibility the chance to bring him in. Mm -hmm. So if it's coming from both of them over this, I, I think that maybe it was floated out, there, but it very quickly. Just, you know, there was there may have been the smell of mm -hmm. there, you know. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think this just kind of blew up because you know somebody just wanted to say something. Well, somebody just wanting to say something and then something blowing up is is where we're going to go with our next last story here. Um, I did mention this last week, but uh, Bayern Munich confirmed that Frank Ribery altercation with reporter Patrick Gilou, uh the French wow. journalist. And the Bayern Munich lightning rod of hate, uh, because he brings it on himself, uh, were involved in a, quote, altercation. Uh, following reports, the player had pushed and slapped him during a post-match interview because there's nothing more Frank Ribery than him slapping someone. Um, <laughs> Prostitutes, the, coaches. Doesn't matter. Um, Ribery uh, had been kind of uh, on the, the bad end of the loss <sighs> to Borussia Dortmund, 3-2, and was kind of responsible for a couple of the goals in Dortmund's comeback win. Uh, Jalou, you know, asked him about it after the game, and apparently Ribéry did not take too kindly of it. Um, obviously, Wes, we, we had the chance, back at the last time we were in Charlotte, to be in the presence of Frank Ribéry, and uh, he almost got into a fight in a friendly with players we have pictures of it thanks to <laughs> yes. thanks to one named technical producer and sometimes photographer Jackie we have pictures of it happening so <laughs> this is in no way shape or form surprising but it is another in the long line of bizarre things that have happened at Baron I mean we talked about you know they they've had a lot of losses already this season they haven't looked great uh they the 
their entire like head of heads of their organization came out and said to journalists, stop writing bad things about us, even though bad things are happening. You know, this is this has been just a very Don't don't do your jobs, damn it. Yeah, exactly. We will hey, hey, them and Trump, we'll just ban you when you piss decorum. Decorum, you people who are terrible. <laughs> we, we, should send, we should send General Costa over. Shoot. <laughs> Um, but I mean, this is, this has been a very unbaron like year for them so far. Very much. Um, we mentioned it with Chelsea earlier in regard. <clears throat> Excuse me. But you want to talk about a team that is in massive need of a refreshing. Yeah. Ooh. And they're, th- the thing is they're doing it, but they're trying to do it while still playing some of the older guys. <clears throat> and you've got guys like Bree and Robin who have been for the last decade have been the crux of Bayern Munich. Mm-hmm. And it's just, you know, it's coming to an end. And, you know, some guys can age gracefully and then some guys are Frank Ribery. Ew. So, <laughs> you know, it's... Um, Both in play style and in the hair department. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's just... It's just one of those things, man. His you know, he he can kind of see. He's already been a pissy character for years, anyway. And this just kind of, you know, I mean, this just plays right onto it. So <clears throat> it's what it is. Um, I, I think you could see Ribery. I think this could be his last rock season. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it come from a transfer or even retirement wouldn't shot me from River at this point. Mm-hmm. But I think you're kind of seeing his last days as a Munich player. Yeah, certainly. I mean, he just he's not really been out on the pitch very much. His goal totals and assist totals right. have definitely been going down. So, yes, I, I think it, his career at Bayern is on its last legs, certainly. Right. Um, our final story, as our news and notes section is also on its last legs, ah, is a story yes. that I'm sure will make Wes very happy. Oh, I'm very uh, happy. Um, this is this is bizarre, but it's of course. Um, a report has come out that Barcelona and Liverpool have come to an agreement that the next time Barcelona wants to buy a player from Liverpool, they have to pay an extra 100 million euros to Liverpool. Before they can do it. And this was part of the Philip Coutinho deal. Um, Paul Joyce of the Times reporting this. Uh, says sporting director Michael Edwards insisted on the clause, which made Barcelona unhappy. Shocker. Uh, Joyce added the clause has effectively warded off the threat of the Catalan club raiding Anfield in the short term. Maybe Southampton could have tried something like this. Um, but Wes, this is... It makes sense... But it's just so weird to see. And it basically means that there's literally no one in, I would imagine, the very foreseeable future. I mean, I'm talking maybe even like 10, 15 years down the line where Barcelona would be willing to pay an extra 100 million euros for. Well, you know, they have been linked with a Liverpool player in the January window. And that's definitely worth 100 million euros. And that's Alberto Moreno. <laughs> But is he um, worth two hundred no, million? <laughs> here's what I say. Here, here's what I say. Liverpool. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna sell Moreno for one hundred thousand pounds <laughs> <laughs> to Barcelona. Hey, Barcelona, we're gonna give them to you for a hundred thousand pounds, and then just throw on that little add-on. <laughs> sure, I'll take eighty-nine million pounds for <laughs> oh for Alberto Moreno. Um, well, I mean, really, I mean, you look at Liverpool or. You know, I guess Barcelona are kind of like what Liverpool was in Southampton. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, you look at the last decade, um, I mean, it's been three really big names. First was Javier Mascarano, uh, then Luis Suarez, and then uh, Philip Coutinho. Three players we did not want to sell. Yeah. But uh, Barcelona came and kind of forced the move on all three of them. Um, when you look at that group Liverpool have in now um, – Guys who would be of obvious interest are the three. Um, you, know, you would have to think, you know, Nabi Keita mm-hmm. with Barcelona um, before signing with Liverpool. Uh, you know, I mean, there there are some guys in there who would definitely be of interest to Barcelona. Um, you know, Virgil van Dijk, perhaps. 
So, I mean, for Liverpool, you know, Michael Edwards, since he's become our sporting director, basically it's coincided with bringing in Klopp. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to say that these guys haven't pretty much hit everything out of the park. Yeah. I mean, other than maybe, um, you know, Loris Carius, but hell, that was only five million pounds. Who gives a shit? <laughs> uh, but, you know, Michael Edwards plays hardball. And, I mean, he got – a, he got a freaking dynamite deal out of Coutinho. Obviously, I mean, the money was insane he got for Coutinho. And then to put this in afterwards, I mean, the man's, I mean, he is looking out for the best interests of his club, which is Liverpool. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it, it's, it seems, it's obviously very out of the area. It's crazy, but hell, I got pulled it off. I'm thrilled. Yeah, <laughs> this absolutely. Is great. Can you, I guess, can you remember anything like this happening before? No, I've never heard of anything like this. I looked at it, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, that's, that was crazy. But, you know, Liverpool are doing some things a little more out of the box. And, <clears throat> you know, what you've guaranteed is either, you know, is either a world record fee Um to get it done because I mean, obviously it would have to be one of the, one of the big time players to do it, which once again, you know, I mean, you know, if you want Mo Salah, oh, we're starting at about 150 million pounds right now. If you want Mo Salah mm-hmm. and Hey, you know, if you want to give us 150 and then another 89 million on top of it, okay. <laughs> you know, Hey, we'll talk now. <laughs> so, you know, Liverpool have got it that either, um, you know, they're going to get a massive fee or you're just not going to come take our players. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, they, they, hey, it's a, it's a win-win for Liverpool at the end of the day. Yeah, big, big win-wins with a lot of, lot of money on the line. So uh, that's, that's going to do it, though, for our news and notes. Let's hit the watch for Wes. As we, as we hit Thanksgiving week here, what are you watching in the week that was or the week that will be? Um, in the last couple of weeks, I have fully caught up as of tonight. Yes. I have fully caught up on Chicago Fire. Oh, my. Um, yeah. I mean, literally like two weeks ago, I was still in like season. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? I've got some time. Let me get on this and let me catch up. Because, of course, horror story's over. Holy Jesus. I'm going to touch that in a second. Holy Jesus. <laughs> uh, horror story's over. Mayans is over. Those are kind of the big three I was watching. Um, SEAL team, I was caught up on that anyway. So, um, But Chicago Fire, yeah, uh, they're going to have their fall finale in two weeks on December 5th. So we'll come up on that. Um, but it's still a good show. It's it's what it is. We got rid of Gabby. Um, so I was happy for that. Uh, you know, Gabby had been there, obviously, since season one and had married Matt Casey. But... I mean, I just wasn't the biggest Gabby fan. So she's gone. That means Matt Casey is back on the market. Yeah. Um, and we got a new partner on the Ambo. Ambo 61. So anyway. Now, for the most important thing of them all, um, American Horror Story. Oh, Holy sweet Jesus. Oh, Jesus Lord. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, everybody basically died last week. Oh, no. Um, yeah. But, I mean, the deaths were incredible. Um, Mallory went back, used her power to go back in time to kill the Antichrist before he realized he was the Antichrist. With a truck. She ran, ran him over four times with a Range Rover, which was fresh. Uh, and then at the end of the show, we, we find out that um, our, our young lovers from early in the show who died in, like, episode three, and we never saw them again, they ended up in this alternate reality getting together and then they had a child which turns out to be the antichrist oh no yes so that's how the uh show ended i i love the season i've seen people oh this is the biggest pile of shit ever you know it's one of those tv things especially something like horror story you can't make everyone happy by any means it's either you know i thought to me it was it is in the top three. It is in a very strong, well, I'll tell you, that is in an extremely strong top four. Mm-hmm. Um, with the first three seasons plus this one are my four favorite. Um, personally, I could have, I would have loved to have seen this season go about two more episodes and have them stretch it out a little more. 
um, just to kind of extend the storytelling some. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I loved it. I thought it was a fantastic season, and um, I think it's one that will aid for it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a good one. I'm hoping if if this is any indication of coming up in the future, getting back to this good storytelling of theirs, I'm happy and I'm impressed. Nice. Um, let's see what what have, what have I been watching the week that was the week that will be. Um, well, uh, we are we are unfortunately I believe going on a bit of a break with my my couple NBC shows and Superstore and the Good Place. Just a couple two weeks break uh, before we get back. Uh, for an episode in early December, but then I believe that after that there might be another break until we get back into January. So a lot of my shows kind of hitting that that break we hit around the mid year point here. Everybody uh, likes to take off this whole December and November. Just you know, we don't really want to do any work, um, which is fine. I don't I don't blame them. Uh, last week tonight with John Oliver. Their season comes to a close, so they won't be back for a couple months. Uh, we'll miss you, John Oliver. Uh, I'm sure Theresa May does not miss you at all. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so what else? What else is going on? Uh, a lot of moves come out. I know Wes, you went to see Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh my god, I did it was so good. Uh, there, I I might be getting dragged to go see that. Um, didn't really have a inkling of going to it but hey it's it's it, really good it's Rami Malik. so it, and he's I mean he to me he absolutely and Mike Myers is in it too so he is but you almost have to th- oh that's Mike Myers well and the only and reason he, I know he's in it is because I saw uh, him uh interviewed on uh the Stephen yeah. Colbert's show well, and they played a clip said, I'll tell you, he's not like over the top Mike Myers right or right yeah I mean, definitely he plays not. He plays a specific character, and he's actually an asshole in it. Yeah, but I mean, he 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 does a really good job. Like I say, I, I literally it took me about two... shit. That's Mike Myers. Yeah. So you know, he wasn't doing any funny voices or anything mm-hmm. like that. I mean, it's a legit role that he has. It's not just oh look, let's put Mike Myers in here. Well, and with his parents being from Liverpool, I mean, it wasn't that hard for him to to kind of slip into that sort of mindset. Well, you know, but, um, I mean, it was, um, I, I personally, I enjoy it. I'm a big, I always like queen. I'm, I've been a big fan my whole life. Um, and Freddie Mercury somewhat fascinates me anyway, mm-hmm. because I mean, he just, he is just this larger than life. I mean, character. Mm-hmm. I mean, really, I mean, the guy's life, he was a character. He was a performer. He was always turned on, you know, mm-hmm. that's the thing. I mean, he, he, you know, it wasn't about flipping the switch. It's like he became this Freddie Mercury human being. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it really humanizes him as well. And, you know, it, I, I thought it was a beautiful movie. I thought it was very well put together. Um, it's fun. It gets a little dark, uh, you know, toward the middle into the end, it, it starts getting dark, but you know what? That's, that's life. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a time in his life he went through and they didn't really sugarcoat it, you know? And then you see him dealing with his disease at the end. And I mean, it's just, I was, I was really impressed with it. I was really impressed with it. Uh, I, I mean, I may go back and see. Well, there you go. So that, that is the watch for, uh, now let's hit, uh, get so raw. And so Wes, why don't you go ahead and do your part? And then I, for the little that it is, and then I will, I will swing in, with uh, my entry into our series on this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this past weekend, I'm not gonna... so I have yet to see Survivor Series, and I have yet to see um, uh, NXT TakeOver. Mm-hmm. Which of course, as you know, when those happen, they always, they're just better anyway. Yes. Um, they have war games this week. I heard TakeOver was just fantastic as always. Um, and Survivor Series, of course, disappointed. Um, the the biggest to me from everything I heard the biggest moment of Survivor Series was Charlotte Flair basically snapping on Ronda Rousey and oh, yeah. having a heel turn which I mean that's the first thing I want to see because shit you know as I kind of told you this whole big thing was I mean that's the hottest thing going in WWE right now um, and with her being out Charlotte came in and then Charlotte snapped and beat the shit out of Ronda Rousey. So 
you know, there's a lot that they're working on and a lot that's going on. Um, and that right now is the most fascinating part of WWE. It's just, God, the product just sucks. At the moment. <laughs> it just sucks. Um, but that, that's the big one to see. I know Brock Lesnar, uh, Raw brand swept the Survivor Series matches. So, um, yeah, like I said, I haven't gotten into this. I'm sorry there. I wish I could give you guys more. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I just haven't really had the chance to jump in and uh, and look at some things. So, uh, I'm sorry. It's a truncated Raw for me, but that's what I got for you. What have you got, in Green? I, well, I, am, I am really thrilled to hear what you got. I, I, I had the beginning, the, the thing that kicked everything off for for the uh the wwe versus nxt take uh survivor series thing yes that's what it's called um i I had the thing that started all on saturday night it got things kicked off and it kicked off in los angeles california in the league of legends arena as team wwe took on team nxt we had on for team WWE we had cesaro we had ruby right i believe it's right uh, yes. We had that's, Tyler. That's, that is somebody. We had Tyler Breeze, and we had yes, Seth yes. Rollins. Seth freaking Rollins, by the way. Seth Rollins, led by their captain. I'm a cutie pie. Uh, and on the team NXT side, we had uh, Charlie Gargano. I don't know his first name. Um, Gargano is his I last can't... name. I don't remember what his first name is. Um. Um. Oh God, Gargano and Champa. Ah. Uh! It's fine. Uh, we had, we had him. We had Dakota Kai. We had Baszler. We had Adam Cole Bay Bay. <sighs> that was Team NXT. And Team NXT took it to Team WWE with Captain Flowers and Austin Creed on the call for the match. Oh, and it was a match that oof, was awful. Like Seth Rollins straight up inted. For most of the game on Team WWE. But T- Dakota Kai took advantage of it. And on Misfortune. Proved to be Seth Rollins' misfortune throughout the match. As she took him out over and over and over again. The MVP of the entire match. 12 kills, 5 assists, just 1 death. On the Misfortune. Adam Cole Bay Bay playing the Draven. And it was welcome to the league of Adam Cole Bay Bay. As he... Bye-bye. 9 kills, 4 assists... For the Draven, played by Adam Cole, as Tyler won, playing on the Janna, got his revenge over his longtime nemesis, I'm a cutie pie, as uh, Big E was pulling for Team NXT, while Kofi Kingston was trying to rep Team WWE, but could not pull them through to a win. So Team NXT took the win, and got Survivor Series started off right for Team NXT, which I heard the rest of it went very poorly for them. But, they got this one, damn it. They got this one. Yeah. I'm telling you, Adam, Adam, I'm telling you dude. Adam Cole is going to save WWE. If he'll... I tell you what, man. I, I was very impressed with his Draven play. And, and I, and I like that he picked... A lot of them pick champions that really like reflect their personality. Cesaro picking the Scion. Very mm-hmm. big, strong tank guy. Uh, Ruby Riot picking Vi. Riot uh, Vile about smashing things. Very punk look uh, to her. Uh, Tyler Breeze picking the blonde heartthrob Ezreal, uh, very, very in line with him, but Adam Cole picking Draven. Oh, oh, the Draven. It's all about the Draven and it's going to be all about Adam Cole, baby. That's what it's all about. So I'm very, very impressed with that. So that, I'm just, I'm just waiting for Adam Cole to say, he's, he's going to be, I actually just speaking about Cole, I, I, I had I was looking through my Facebook stuff the other day and some of my saved videos, and I came across my absolute favorite promo of all time, and it was one Adam Cole. It's been, I think it's been two years ago now, <clears throat> two or three years ago at this point. And I look back on it, it's just I watch it and it's better than anything WWE's put out since it happened. Oh, I mean, it's so good. Adam Cole, Adam Cole's great in the ring. Adam Cole's an amazing promo. And if they will, and this is the problem with WWE, the problem with guys going to WWE is they get there and then WWE like takes away their best things that they do. If they will just let Adam Cole be Adam Cole, mm-hmm. 
Oh my god. They could they could revolutionize wrestling if they will just let some of these guys be themselves and not this little watered down PG WWE version of themselves. Oh no. Oh no. It's got it's gotta be amazing. But uh yeah. but yeah, that, so now you understand probably. what the picture was I sent you the other week. Um I get it now. I, I literally had no idea of Austin Creed okay. talking and <laughs> casting with my boy Captain Flowers. Oh god, I, lo- I love Captain I Flowers it. so much. I get it now. <sighs> Clayton Reigns and Austin Creed on the call. That was great. Yeah. Hell yeah. So that's gonna do it for So Raw, and that's gonna do it for this edition of the Foreign Affair Podcast. Episode 237 is about to be in the books. Wanna give a quick shout to our uh, presenters, including NGSC Sports. At NGSC Sports, we never stop, even if this podcast is about to. As well as Alicia's Pillows and Things. You can find them on the social media. You can find us on the Twitter as a collective. We are at AFA Pod. Wes, you are? I'm at Wes Bradshaw 21. I'm at Edward Green. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube via our parent show, The All New Sports Show. You can also email us at that address, All New Sports Show at gmail.com also thanks to our podcast providers including podbean.com stitcher speaker iHeartRadio, the tune in radio app google play music and the itunes ipod or not itunes itunes music store there we go uh we'll be back next week right we'll be back next week yes. um I, I i gotta work next wednesday night so you're... all right so it's gonna be a split i'm gonna go ahead and make a note on that so i um actually... and it's only gonna be massive because of course they PSG in Paris, mm-hmm. and oh, we didn't. I alluded to it, but we didn't actually mention it. Um, huge injury news for PSG. Yes, both Neymar and Mbappe could miss that Champions League, that very crucial Champions League match with them trying to stay alive. If Liverpool beat them, mm-hmm. I think if Liverpool win and Napoli win, PSG's done. Yeah. They're done. They're yeah. out. And Napoli, of course, had Red Star in Naples, so you got to figure there's a good chance of that. Mm-hmm. So PSG are playing for their Champions League lives. Well, it, it proves to it could prove to be a very spicy Anfield corner we get next week on the pod. Then, as I will be bringing you recaps of this big weekend of Premier League action, which includes Tottenham versus Chelsea on Saturday. Oh yeah, uh, and then again a big week of Champions League action to come on Tuesday and Wednesday. But that'll be next week. We'll be bringing you that. Uh, as for this week's episode, we're about done. But before we get out of here, Wes, is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, high school football playoffs. We're in um, playoffs. second round. Playoffs. We're in the second round here in the state of North Carolina and the five area teams that I gave a shit about. <laughs> did, you, did you catch And the one you didn't. <laughs> and the one I didn't. Yeah, I guess. I never found their score. Once again. They won. They won. Good for them. I knew they were up big. But once again, I can't ever find a damn final for them. So, yeah, I forget them. Kiss my ass. Oh, um, my area teams are still in. Um, round two, we can see what happens. Rocky Mountain hitting the road, going to Terry Sanford, who eliminated them last year in the playoffs. Mm. So, they're looking for some revenge. Uh, Southern Nash suddenly can't play defense. Yeah. So, they're, they've already gotten to a point. They said they're going to have to outscore everyone. Oh, so, boy. uh Fine. Luckily, they have two of the best running backs in the state, so they can kind of do that. Did you so, guys who still care about the NFL like the Chiefs Rams game on Monday night? Well, guess I am, what? I, I'm going to tell you what. That I watched the second half of that game because I was at work. Mm-hmm. Todd's playing. We'll watch some Todd. Sure, Todd. And I'm not going to lie now. Just for the neutral of a football fan that I am, at, mm-hmm. that was fucking fun. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, NFL, if you could give me that every week. <laughs> nah, still not going to You still kiss my ass. But that was that was highly entertaining. <laughs> I've enjoyed the meme going around this year that uh, they've canceled the playoffs and they're just going to play a best of seven. Sure. Um, I could almost get with that, but uh, New Orleans might have something to say about that. But anyway. Um, but uh, Southern End, Tarboro. <laughs> Tarboro <laughs> gets to play their first playoff game this week. Yeah. So sorry for whoever's catching that ass whooping. <laughs> Uh, Southwest still in, Beddingfield still in, Southwest. Oh, the way, Southwest Edgecombe looks really good. Yeah, they've got a nice run to you know to the Eastern Final. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I really, I legitimately think they have Tarboro, Southwest Edgecombe, and potentially Southern Nash in the Eastern Finals this year. 
unfortunately for Rocky Mountain, if they get past Sanford, they have a third round date with Havelock. <laughs> hey, well, they didn't get a chance to play him in the regular season, so now they can play exactly. Him <laughs> <laughs> Havelock's still kind of looking for revenge after we shot. What? <laughs> I, <we're, laughs> what? What happened that game? I don't remember, Wes. I was too cold. Hey, go back and listen. I'm sure I broke it down on here. <laughs> yes, yes, you did. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, that's me. We got we got play. Um. Yeah, then I'll have to find something else to talk about because I'm dead. Basketball is just dead to me in general right now. You guys not doing basketball anymore? Mm, no. Oh, womp womp. Yeah. womp, womp, womp. Unlucky. But we are going to keep doing the podcast, and it will be back next week. Again, uh, Wes will not be live, but he will be bringing us Anfield Corner, so don't you worry. Until then, for my calling crime, Wes Bradshaw, I am Edward Green. Until next week, stay safe, enjoy Thanksgiving. And enjoy the football, but not the one they're playing tomorrow. No, this weekend's football. Don't forget to check out the college games. It's Robert. Good night, Ohio State. I hope your fucking shit's done this week. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody likes them. The only problem is in Michigan's in, basically. Yeah. You're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't with that group. Well, maybe, hey, hey, hey. The Ohio State loses to Michigan, and then Michigan loses the Big Ten title game. There you go. And then or Iowa our, gets in. Or is our good friend Connor McGregor say, ah, feck them all. <laughs> there you go. Just feck them all. Oh, yes. And he has to be our good friend Connor McGregor, because if it's not, then he will probably destroy us. Hey, he's a Liverpool fan, so you know he's good with me. <laughs> so you've got Finn Balor, and I've got Connor There you go. sponsored by Alicia's Pillows and Things. Check out the Facebook page, Alicia's Pillows and Things, where you will find home decor you will not be able to resist at prices anybody can afford. Check out the pillows and stools of your favorite sports teams. Maybe you want a set of your kid's favorite cartoon or movie character. You can also get full body and neck pillows as well. Log on to NGSCSports.com and go to the Alicia's Pillows and Things tab on the homepage to complete your order. It makes a great gift for Christmas at an affordable price. NGSC Sports. We never stop. You're listening to NGSC Sports Radio. Hear us live on NGSCSports.com where you can get awesome analysis for all things sport. Or check out our podcasts on iHeartRadio, Spreaker, iTunes, TuneIn, and much more. For our latest videos, head to NGSC Sports' YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter at NGSC Sports and like us on Facebook. NGSC Sports. We never stop.